Uh, good morning. Good to see you today. Welcome to uh, New Hope Community Church. It's great to have you with us. Before we do our normal opening announcements on the big screen, I want to take a moment to do two things. First off, uh, many of you have commented about how I clean up very nicely. Um, <laughs> I thought I should prove to you I do know how to wear a suit, okay, just because I haven't worn one in a while. Um, actually, the reason for this today is yesterday we celebrated the life of Frank Hicks. He'd been a member of our church since 1993, had served three terms as an elder board member here at New Hope, and back at the uh, just before Christmas, uh, Frank went home to be with Jesus, and his memorial service was yesterday. When I looked at my closet to decide what to wear for his service, I knew that Frank used to wear a blue plaid sports jacket frequently to church. And I said, that's the one I need to wear. So when I took it off yesterday, I just left it hanging in a prominent place so I wouldn't have to decide what to wear today. Um, now that's out of the way. Let me talk just a moment. Um, some might say what I'm going to do in the next couple of minutes is political. I try not to engage uh, much in politics, but there are times that our spiritual life has to impact every arena of our life. And that even includes our politics. I've never once told you how to vote from this podium. And today there's no elections going on. I'm not going to tell you how to vote. I'm not asking you to support or not support the president in any decision that he is making. But what I am here to do is to share my deep sadness over events of this past week. And that if there's ever a time in my lifetime in ministry where God's people need to humble themselves and pray for our nation, it is at our current state of affairs. This is not a pro or anti-abortion. I am a pro-life person. I don't make any apologies about that. And if you are here today and you've ever had to go through the process personally or in your family, of an abortion. This is not an indictment against you at all. Please understand that. And I am more disturbed by the response of people than almost the decision itself. There are times in our lives that either as a government, as a family, we have to make some hard decisions. What I'm about to say is not a pro-death sentence or anti-death sentence. When you have to make that decision as a state and as a nation, will we use the death penalty as a means of, of uh, criminal justice system? If you make that decision for the death sentence, there should not be a celebration or a party that follows that decision. If you think it's right and you think it's necessary and it is what becomes the law of the land, you do that with great fear and trepidation. The decision that the state of New York made this past week to affirm abortion up till the day before birth and that it can be practiced by not only medical doctors, but midwives, and then for high fives to take place and you light up the city in celebration of this decision, I think is a travesty to our nation. What really brought this home to me was the day following that decision, I was in my doctor's office. I've known my doctor since high school. We've had a few faith-based conversations. <clears throat> he's never given me a strong indication where he is. He's now opened a door for me to pursue that. But after I was there this week getting malaria medication for our trip to Africa, uh, after we finished the medical side of things, he said, Tim, I need some help. I said, anything I could do, Jeff, let me know. He said, how did our world get to be in such a mess? He said, this ruling has me so disturbed. He said, I am here to tell you from a medical perspective, a doctor of 40 years now nearly, there is no justifiable health reason for any mother to be 
to have a late term abortion the day before it could be delivered. There is no, there is no reason medically. I've done my life doing this. There's no reason to inject poison into the brain of an unborn infant so that it is born dead in just a few hours is absolutely an abomination to life. And so I simply want us to begin this morning as a church praying for the attitudes and the hearts of those because here, here's where we're faced folks. Let's face reality. If New York has done this, the state that you and I live in is not going to be very far behind because we don't like to be behind in any of those kind of decisions, unfortunately. And so for me it is how as a nation we have become so callous. I can't imagine as my daughter-in-law stands there holding my grandson. <laughs> I can't imagine her saying the day before he was born, you know, this is not going to be good for my emotional well-being. I need to eliminate this child. And that is where we've gotten to. So we need to pray for our leaders. We need to pray for those of us as citizens. I don't know the answers to a response, but we need to pray for two things, wisdom and then courage. Because this is a critical time for us. Again, this is exactly what was predicted we would get to in the 70s when Roe versus Wade was decided upon. And this is where we have now arrived. And what's next? What if the board is now I discovered they're inconvenient? Oh. All right. Yeah, we're having a meltdown here. How's <laughs> <laughs> everybody? That's the uh, evil one wanting to interfere with what we're doing. But uh, we have a check the input signal. So we're going to do that right now and we're going to pray. And our input signal is going to go through regardless of what happens here. Let's pray. Father, the scripture says that each morning we can be glad and we can rejoice in the day that you've given us to live. And that is true today. You've given us a beautiful day, and you've given us the privilege of life to experience the joys that you have for us today. But in the midst of the beauty of this day, there is the ugliness of our world. And Father, the most recent ugliness has to do with political decisions that have moral consequence. And so, Father, I pray for those who are in leadership, those who have been elected to express the will of the people, that they will have wisdom and courage to speak out, not to be afraid to be labeled, not to be afraid to be categorized, not to be afraid of the response of an opposing view. But Father, that they will stand up for life. They will stand up for that which is moral. Father, I pray for your leadership in all of our lives, for those of us as pastors, for those of us as members of your family, I pray that you will give us wisdom to know how to respond in the times that we live in. Father, I pray for a great sense of conviction. It wouldn't be the first time that, that people have made poor decisions and then regretted it later. And Father, I pray that there will be those like Governor Cuomo who made what I believe is a very, very poor decision. And I pray, Father, that the responses he's hearing from his own priest will bring a sense of conviction to his heart and he'll realize that politics is not to be about power and influence, but it's about to be service for the good of the people. And the choices made this week are not for the good of the people. So we simply trust you. And then I, I pray that we will be motivated by your wisdom and the courage you will provide for us. Be not only good citizens of your kingdom, but be good citizens of this country. Teach us how to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I would now like to draw your attention. Oh, hold on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Though your blind eyes are open, strongholds are broken, I am living by faith, nothing is impossible. Those are perfect words for us to remember 
in the follow-up to that prayer that we just prayed together. We will pray that blind eyes will be open, strongholds, strongholds will be broken, and because of faith, nothing is impossible. Let's see our morning announcements. Hey, welcome to New Hope Community Church. For those of you that are new or visiting, we'd like for you to please fill out a Connect card, usually located in the pew right in front of you. For members and attendees, uh, if you have a prayer request or a, an address change, please uh, fill out the same card. We're glad you're here. Enjoy the service. We'll be having a monthly men's breakfast on February the 9th. We start with coffee at 7.30 and then we'll eat at 8. So you're welcome to come along meet other guys in the church, and eat some delicious breakfast. Hi, mark your calendars for March 24th. It's our Mexico Mission Pie Auction. So bring your pies, buy some pies, and send a kid to Mexico. Hi everyone, I'm Shelly. And I'm Jordan from the High School Youth Group. We're here to talk about the upcoming Senior Luncheon, Tuesday, February 12th, when we put into action the most memorized verse of the Bible. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Absolutely, we're going to be combining the high school group along with the seniors in a mentorship program. We'd also like to encourage the seniors that are 55 to 65 to join us that day so you can be a vital part of helping the high school ministry. Jordan, I'm gonna ask you a few questions. Okay. So Jordan, when did you first come to New Hope? I was about 10 years old when Teddy and Christy invited me to the Girls for God group. And what is Girls for God? It was a Bible study where we would meet on Friday nights, um, girls fourth through sixth grade, and we'd get paired up with um, women mentors who we created bonds with and got to study the Bible with. Wonderful. What was that age group? Do you remember? Do you, how old were you? I was 10, okay. and we had mentors all the way up to age 70. 70. Very good. And then what's that relationship like now, six years later? We still um, love, encourage, and pray for each other, and we have a great relationship. So sign up and attend that seniors lunch and grab a youth. After all, we're only a pavilion away. Happy Sunday, Happy everyone. Happy Sunday. Okay, so senior lunch, sign up. Uh, you do not have to bring a thing for this senior lunch, all right? Uh, lunch is going to be made available. It's a catered meal for $5, so all you got to bring is your $5 bill. And if you don't have one, just show up anyway, but we do want you to sign up, all right? So we make sure we have enough food for everybody that day. And as you discovered, there's going to be a youth emphasis at our senior luncheon this next month. And uh, this is really important as our high school group gears up to go to Mexico because we're going to be asking you to pray for them on that mission trip every single day. And you'll have a name and a face, and you can connect that to your prayers. And so we want you to participate in that. So the sign-up sheets are coming around so that you can do that. There is also going to be, um, <clears throat> in February, I believe it is February the 19th, there is the Fresno Clovis Prayer Breakfast. And it's downtown at the convention center. And Tony Evans, pastor from Texas, is going to be the speaker this year. He's one of my favorite preachers. If you would like to go to that breakfast, it goes from 7 to 9. And if you want to attend that breakfast, we have two tables reserved. Uh, one table is full already, so we have room for about 9 or 10 more. They're $25 a ticket. Uh, see Shelly after the service. She has the clipboard, all right, up here, that we can add your name if you would like to be a part of that very special breakfast. Let me highlight just a couple of other things real quick. Uh, Akira, would you stand up, please? All right, in this service. Uh, this is the 915 service representative to Africa, all right? Uh, on the front of your bulletin, all right, this is a prayer reminder. Put this somewhere for the next three weeks that you can remember to pray for all four of us. We will be leaving next Saturday morning. We have to be at the airport at 415 a.m., for a 605 departure to Salt Lake City where we get to hang out for eight hours and five minutes. <laughs> and then we have a non-stop flight to Paris, France. We should be arriving in Paris uh, around this time next Sunday. We will be in Paris, all right? Uh, and then we have a three-hour layover in Paris uh, where it'll either be snowing, raining, or freezing. Uh, that's been my experience the last six years. And from there, we will then uh, have another six-and-a-half-hour flight to Abidjan, 
Ivory Coast, Africa. We will have about five hours of sleep. We will get up at uh, 5 or 5.30 in the morning so that we're on a bus by 6 o'clock. And then we have a 12 to 18 hour bus ride to the village of Doropo where ministry begins to take place after that. All right. And so this is a medical mission trip. We have four surgeons, two other doctors, uh, a dozen or so nurses, a couple of anesthesiologists, uh, some vacation Bible school kids fest workers, some construction workers, and we will be engaged in uh, medical uh, surgical procedures, uh, vacation Bible school kids fest in two villages, and a couple of construction projects. And we will return back here on Saturday the 16th of February. So please be praying for us. Now, I mentioned this briefly last week. My last chance to say this before I go. Last year, the first Sunday I was gone, 215 of you decided to go somewhere as well. <laughs> Our church attendance dropped from this Sunday to next Sunday by 215 people. That ain't nice. Okay? Just because the pastor's away doesn't mean the members go away. All right? Your associate pastor will be preaching. He works just as hard, if not harder, on sermons than I do. And he does a great job delivering them. So I expect to see... When I call and check in, I expect a picture of a full sanctuary, all right, in the ninth. And I'm going to have them tell me which service screwed up, all right? <laughs> so uh, anyway, the next two weeks, you just plan on like normal, being here like you normally would, all right? And thank you very much. I'm not going to say any more about that today. Uh, that's two weeks, yeah, but Super Bowl doesn't start till three o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> Okay, sorry about that, but da, 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 da. oh, Teresa, you're in this service. Yeah, what are you doing here early? You're oh, that's right, you're trained. Teresa, stand up. She's part of the 11 o'clock crowd normally. All right, her first trip, and Linda Brobst, all right, was in the 8 o'clock service, and it's her first trip. So we're taking three rookies. Did you get your visa yesterday? Today. Today, okay, all right, all right. We're still nervous, okay, on that one. All right, uh, if you have a sponsorship letter, uh, I, I, let me say that differently. If you sponsor a child in the village of Neonan and you would like a special letter to go to them, please, uh, please get it here by Wednesday. We would love for you to do that, okay? Um, I don't do a lot of birthdays here, but we got a couple. We, we got somebody who just turned 90 this past week who's sitting right here on the second row. All right, stand up, stand up. Can you? All right, look at that. He still can stand. All right, 90 years old. Chick, where are you? Chick, Chick, is Chick around? Chick. All right, he's 86. He's just a kid, all right? Have you noticed all these old men are short? There's hope for me then, isn't there? I'm going to be around a long time. That's good. That's good. Uh, and yesterday also was our daughter's birthday. She's not near as old as either one of those two, all right? So anyway, I uh, just happened to know about those. Let me update on a couple of prayer requests, and then we'll get engaged in our worship. Uh, it's great to have Dan with us today. He starts treatment up again, I think, next week, but the follow, but he's been doing good, and we're happy about that. Continue to pray for Dan. Uh, Irma. Irma has to stay in isolation, uh, when I say isolation, in her home for one more week uh, as a result of all the treatment she's been through. Immune system's very low. She did catch this virus that's going around and had to go back to Stanford. Uh, but she's home but has to stay isolated for a little bit longer. Good to see Jerry Brown up and out and active again. So Jerry, thanks for being here. Two surgeries this past week, Trish Sanchez and Sana, Shana Scalzo. Both of them are home and doing very well. And for that, we are grateful. Uh, Tuesday evening. Uh, while a portion of our small group was out to dinner before we went to small group, we're sitting there eating. And uh, for some reason, I turned and looked back at the door and I had to take a double take of who walked in because I couldn't believe it. Uh, Matt Actus, our missionary to Uganda, all right? And, and he's in Clovis. 
And uh, so anyway, we had a chance to visit briefly. Uh, Matt had to make an unexpected trip back. His grandmother, who lives in Southern California, uh, passed away, and he came home for memorial services. Wasn't sure he was going to get up to here from Southern California, but he did for a few days. So be praying for Matt and his family as they go through this season of life and as he heads back to Africa to be with his wife and his daughters who were there. So please be praying for him. Uh, he probably doesn't want to be pointed out, so I'm not going to make him stand, but we do have a guest in our service today, another pastor in Clovis, uh, Joe Lavanino. And uh, Joe pastors the uh, Loma Vista Church. And I do want to, during the prayer for the offering, we also want to pray for Joe's church. They are in a building project. They have been in uh, school facilities for 20 some years, 23 years. And uh, they are now at the corner of Shaw and McCall. And so every time you drive by there, pray for them. He is a good man. He's done a great work there. And uh, they still have to get some more work done before they can move in. They're probably a year away. They're needing to do some more fundraising. We know what that's all about here right now. And so we want to pray for them and what God is doing in their part of the community and the imprint that they are making in that area. So we're very grateful. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward, wait on us as we have our tithes and offering. I'm being told something up here. Oh, thank you. Yes, it was a text I got and my memory's short. Randy, your daughter-in-law has been diagnosed with viral meningitis. Yes. And so your son, who is uh, serving his country overseas, may be being brought home in order to be with his wife. So we want to be praying for Randy's daughter-in-law. Just got that as a text this morning. So let's be praying for them during this prayer. Thank you. Our Father, we love you so very much. I'm grateful that we can come to you with our needs, our hurts, our frustrations, our pains, our desires. And Father, we can make them all available to you and your resources. And so today, we bring to you the needs of our nation. We bring to you the needs of our community. Thank you for the way in which you're working through our project here to build the barn. Father, we pray for our good friend and dear pastor, Joe, and the Loma Vista Church. Thank you for getting them to where they are in their building project. And we pray uh, for, for your resources to be released into their area so that they can complete that and begin to make even a greater impact than they already have in that part of Clovis. Father, we pray for those who are going through, through treatments right now, for Dan and for Irma. Thank you for where they are in that process. Thank you for the, the, the good news that we've received from both of them. But Lord, we continue to trust you for those ongoing needs and ongoing treatment. Lord, for Randy's daughter-in-law and the uh, recent diagnosis and the health challenges that she is facing. And the challenges, Lord, that Randy's son is going through the frustration of being so far away from his wife at this time. So we just commit to you all of those needs. And if there's any way in any of these that you can use those of us who are here to be, um, to be offerings of hope and resources, an available ear to listen, an available person to pick up, deliver, to do anything. May you find us ready, willing, and able to do so. Father, for the privilege of giving today, we say thanks. We commit all this to you in the awesome name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks. Tim and worship team, great job today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I invite you uh, to find in your Bibles our uh, theme chapter for the year. If you would turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll be reading from there in just a moment. Uh, take a couple of minutes just to catch up. Uh, if uh, this is your first Sunday back in the new year, you're visiting with us, you've been on vacation for a while, our thrust around new hope for 2019 is centered on the subject of sharing our faith with others. It's about evangelism. Uh, we're always interested in evangelism, but sometimes we focus on other things and we get distracted from what I believe is absolutely most important for us is the body of Christ, and that is sharing our faith with others. If we say we're a Christian, and let me just define what that means again, it's not that you're a member of a Baptist church or a Presbyterian church or a Methodist church. What it means is you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Nothing less, nothing more, nothing else. 
A personal relationship with Jesus Christ happens not because you're born in America, not because you're born to parents who are Christians. It happens when you individually, you personally, acknowledge the truth about who you are according to the scriptures. All of us have found ourselves in the same boat, dead in our trespasses and sins. We are sinners. Sinners is not defined by people who commit adultery or steal. A sinner is someone who is independent from God. I haven't consulted God about the direction of my life, the path of my life, or my future. I'm doing things my way. That's all of us at some point in our life. We've come to the conclusion that when we die, there's something beyond this veil of, of, of death. And we'd like to go to heaven, not hell. And we believe that Jesus is who he said he was, did what he said he would do. He lived, died, and on the third day was raised from the dead. We celebrate Christmas because of the resurrection. We celebrate Easter because it is the day of the resurrection. And we are now going to appropriate what Jesus Christ did. Oh, can't see it. On a cross for us. I'm a sinner. Jesus is my Savior. I invite him to come live in my life. That's what it means to be a Christian. If we believe that to be true, and that's happened in us, I have now looked at, not based upon what I've done, but who I belong to, as we just sung about, to Jesus Christ. I am a saint and a child of God, not because of my good works or my significant contributions. But I'm a child of God and I'm a member of the church because I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I have his presence in me in life for every moment that I live from this moment until the day God calls me home through death. And then when I die, I am not dead. I go to be with Jesus in heaven. If that is true about us, and that is good news, then why in the world do we as Christians keep it to ourselves? And so we're looking at this year and everything that we do, from our activities in our high school group and our children's Sunday school classes to our morning worship to our small group activities. We want there to be this underlying thought in all that we say and do of how could we use this moment, this situation, these circumstances as a stepping stone of sharing our faith with others who don't know this truth and who don't have this relationship. And so the thrust, not every sermon this entire year is all going to be on evangelism, but every one this month is. And if you've missed the others, they're on the website. You can go and get caught up. But I'm going to catch you up a little bit about what we hit last week, and then we're going to jump into new territory today. But our theme chapter for this entire year is going to come out of what Paul wrote to the believers at the church in a, 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 a town called Corinth. And we're going to pick up at verse 14, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For Christ's love compels us. For Shelley's love compels me to come home every day. I love telling people I'm married to Shelley. And it comes because of love. If in a human marriage we have a love like that, how in the world can we not have a love like that in a relationship with Jesus Christ? The Bible says that he is our husband. He's the bridegroom. You and I are the bride. That's the relationship that we have with him. If we love sharing our spouse with those around us, why in the world would we not want to share our Savior with those around us? The love of Christ compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, Jesus for us, and therefore all died to our sins in him. And he died for all those that that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but we should live for the one who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. I must confess, there was a moment this past Tuesday that I looked at Governor Cuomo from a worldly point of view. And I had to realize that the Jesus who died on a cross for me died on a cross for Governor Cuomo. I can't look at him based upon the actions that he has done. I need to look at him through the eyes of the love that compels me to see him as Jesus sees him. Someone who God loves. Though we once regarded Christ this way, Paul said, I once looked at Christ from a worldly point of view, and I, in fact, I even killed those who wanted to follow him. 
but that's not true about me anymore. Therefore, if any was in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and he gave to us, the church, you and me, the ministry of reconciliation. That God reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. Aren't you glad for that? Some of you are saying, Tim, I have not done a horrible thing in my life. <laughs> that could be true. You may have not done a horrific thing yet in your life, but I guarantee you, you've thought about doing some horrific things in your life. <laughs> guarantee that. Real. And, God, <laughs> and God says, I'll even forgive you of those things that you thought. And he has committed to us this message of reconciliation. Verse 20, we are therefore, you and me, not just the hit men called pastors. All of us in the church, we are Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We are walking advertisements of deity. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For God made him who knew no sin, that is Jesus, to be sin for us. So that in him, you and I, could become the righteousness of God. So what's going to be our perspective? What's going to shape our mindset about wanting to share our faith with others, the subject we call evangelism? You would actually remember the five things we looked at last week. Evangelism is aiming to persuade, not argue, but we do aim to persuade people, not that we are right, but that Jesus loves them. And so we have to have an aim to persuade. Second of all, evangelism is not a sales pitch. We're not trying to get notches in our belt, all right? We're not getting commissioned for everyone that we get to believe in Jesus Christ. This is not a sales pitch. You and I are saved into a life like Christ. It's marked by both blessing and hardship. And as we share Christ with people, they need to know that reality. Evangelism is telling people the truth. Uh -huh. Somebody once said, what we win them with, we win them to. As we have a desire to win people to a relationship with Jesus Christ, we want to win them to the biblical Jesus. There are some people who preach a very unbiblical Jesus. Mm -hmm. There are some people who preach Jesus as Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is ask and he'll give you everything you want. Trust me, you would not like it if he gave you everything you want. May I just remind you of King Hezekiah real quick? Yeah. King Hezekiah would have gone down in the history of Israel as the second greatest king who ever ruled the nation. The only one more popular than him would have been King David. Hezekiah is barely known by most folks today. And the reason is he asked God for something he wanted that God didn't want him to have. He persisted with God three times. And God finally said, if you want what I don't want you to have, I'm going to give it to you. You see, he was about to die. And he didn't want to die. And so God gave him more life. He gave him another 15 years. In that next 15 years, he went from a wonderful, peaceful kingdom to a kingdom that was now in trouble. He went from being loved to being hated. He fathered another son. His son's name was Manasseh. His son's name is more, more well known in, in Jewish history than Hezekiah. Manasseh is known as one of the most evil kings who ever reigned the nation of Israel. And he was born in those 15 years that he begged God to let him live. You see, you either think you're God or you believe he's God. There's nothing wrong with sharing your needs and putting your petitions before him. But if he says no, except no, he knows what's better for you. If he says yes, enjoy it. If he says wait, be content. This is where you and I have to trust the sovereignty of God for our own lives. Sometimes we need to tell folks the truth about Jesus and that he's not a Santa Claus. He is the Lord and Master, the Savior of our lives. And he wants to conform us to his image. 
Jesus himself said, in this world, you will have trouble. A Christian life is not a trouble-free life. But it is a life that faces trouble, not alone. But in the companionship of one who said, I have overcome the troubles of this world. Number four, evangelism is an act of love. We must look at sharing our faith with others as if we are loving them. When you buy a Christmas gift for a member of your family, when you buy a birthday gift for a member of your family, why do you do it? Out of obligation? If you do, shame on you. You should purchase a gift as an act of love because you care. You're interested. You are invested in that person and you want to do something. By the compelling love of Christ, according to Paul, we should share our faith with others. And number five, evangelism is not to be feared. People so often are afraid because I can't answer everybody's questions. You don't have to. Sharing your personal faith is not, does not mean you have to be a theologian who has every answer to every difficult question. And trust me, if you are sharing with your faith with somebody and they keep asking you questions, there's a good chance they're not interested in coming to know Jesus yet. That they are, they are asking the hardest questions. They're asking questions about creation. They're asking questions about dinosaurs. They're asking questions about resurrection from the dead. They're, they're asking all those questions because they don't want to deal with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And there's nothing wrong with saying, I don't know the answer, but that's a good question. I'll go find out. But let me tell you what Jesus has done for me. Amen. See, nobody can argue about that question. That there's a picture that hangs in my office. I've brought it out on a few occasions. I've put it here in front of the podium. It's been a couple of years since I've done that. It's a really big picture. It's in a heavy wooded frame, all right? And it hangs behind my desk. And people often ask me if they don't know who my dad is. And by the way, Pops is not here. Um, he'll be here third service. He's usually here all three. Some of you have been asking. Uh, he fell last night in his garage, and so he's a little sore today. And he said, I'm just going to do one service today. So he'll be here at 11. So people sometimes who don't know me ask, is that your dad? And I say, no, no, but he's the closest thing to family without being blood related. And they'll usually say, well, what do you mean by that? And I say, well, let me tell you Gene's story. My, my mom and dad knew Gene Fry when they were all kids in Oklahoma. Gene became career military. He was 28, 28 years in the Army. That's such a nice melody. Um, <laughs> it's good for the story. It would sound really good. Um, <laughs> My mom and dad had not seen Gene in, uh, in probably 20-some years. My dad dropped off a cousin at the Greyhound bus depot, and as my dad was leaving, uh, a bum, Skid Row bum, came up to my dad and said, aren't you Lonnie Rowland? And my dad said, well, yeah, you have me at a disadvantage. I, I don't know who you are. And he said, Lonnie, I'm Gene, Gene Fry. I said, oh, I'm sorry, drunk, been living on the streets. My dad tried to bring him home with him that night, and Gene wouldn't come. He was embarrassed. And so uh, a week later, there's a, uh, our doorbell rings at our house. We're having dinner, and I jump up. I was 15. My sister was, well, never mind how old she was. <laughs> and uh, I jumped and ran to the door, and I opened it up, and there was this well-dressed gentleman standing there, a taxi in the driveway. He was kind of swaying. And as soon as he spoke, he said, is this Lonnie Rowland's home? I knew he was drunk. I could smell it through the screen door. I went to the dining room table and I said, Dad, there's a drunk man at the door. He's asking for you. <laughs> Dad got up and went to the door and he brought Gene in and he said, my sister and I, I'm 15, my sister's 20. Oh, I wasn't going to tell you tonight. <laughs> and sent us to our rooms, uh, <laughs> at 15 and 20, sent us to our rooms while they sobered Gene up at the dining room table. They tried to get Gene help that night, and he refused it. He took a taxi back to wherever he was staying. A week passed, and my dad got a call from Fresno Police Department. They had found his card on the dresser in the California hotel where Gene had passed out, and nobody had seen him for two or three days, and they had called for the police to enter the room and see what shape he was in, and he was passed out, empty bottles all on the floor. What can we do with him? My dad said, well, he's a veteran. Take him to VA hospital. Put him in detox. I'll, I'll meet you down there. Gene spent uh, three or four days in detox, and then Dad was, uh, our church at that time at Fresno, was building a sanctuary and doing all the work themselves. And so Dad said, Gene, I'll pick you up every morning at 6 a.m. I'll bring you home at 9 p.m., and uh, we'll get you a place to live, and we'll see if we can turn your life around. Over the six months, that was the pattern, and Gene became part of our lives. 
Every Friday night we had dinner at our house and every Saturday night Gene took our family out to dinner. Six months into that process, Gene gave his life to Jesus Christ. And eventually Gene became an elder of this church here before he passed away in 2002. Um, the picture in my office of Gene was taken just about a year before he died. Gene was in his 80s. In that picture, Gene looks younger than he did the first time I met him when he was just in his 50s. You see, that's what the good news of Jesus Christ does Amen. to a person. Amen. The old passes away. Everything becomes new. And who's going to argue with a story like that? Yours may not be that drastic. Yours could be more drastic. It's why I'm asking you to send me your stories. You can go online. You can find where it says share your faith story. All right. And you can just answer some of the questions there. Because in the future, we're going to share some of your stories. Uh, we won't use your name unless we get your permission first. But we may share the story. But if we use your name, we'll always get your permission. But you see, nobody can argue with the difference that Christ has made in your life. And we need to be willing to share that story. I read a story about a Christian recently who prayed, Lord, if you want me to witness to somebody today, please give me a sign and show me who it is. That very day, this gentleman found himself on an almost empty bus when this big burly man comes in and sits down right next to him. This timid believer anxiously waited for his stop to show up so he could exit the bus. <laughs> However, before he could get off, this big burly guy next to him burst into tears and began to cry. This big, the contrite man cried out in a loud voice, I'm a lost sinner. I need the Lord. Would somebody tell me how to get saved? He turned to this Christian gentleman and he pleaded, Can you show me how to find Jesus? The believer immediately bowed his head and prayed, Lord, is this the sign? <laughs> I'm afraid too many of us are like that, all right? We, we are so bashful about this incredibly good news that we have uh, we're afraid we're going to mess it up somehow and we don't take advantage of those opportunities I recently read an article this is about a church not an individual and I thought it was an interesting contrast and maybe you can think about it in the context of our own church the church that is alive and well is growing when there's no growth there's a problem some churches have parking problems and some churches don't some churches have kids running around making a lot of noise, and some other churches tend to be very quiet. Some churches have to set up extra chairs during the services. Some have plenty of room to lay down on a pew. Some churches usually have more expenses than money, and some other churches don't need to spend much money. Some churches are growing so fast you don't always know everybody's name. and some other churches, everybody has always known everybody's name. Some churches enthusiastically and generously support missions. Some other churches keep it all at home. Some churches are filled with tithers. Other churches are filled with tippers. I thought that one was kind of funny, actually, guys. Some churches evangelize. Other churches fossilize. Some churches are always planning for the future. Other churches live in the past. Some churches seek new ministries and new methods. Other churches have no need to. If you were active in some church, why don't you take a moment and pray for your church today? Some people pray for their church, and others never seem to get around to it. We're going to pause for just a moment. This is not the end of the sermon. But as we've talked about evangelism for these last four weeks, both personally and collectively as a church, have you prayed about the idea? Maybe this is a good moment for all of us to do so. So I'm going to ask that you bow your heads. You can pray your own prayer about the subject if you'd like, or maybe as you listen to my words, you'll adopt them as your own prayer. As personally and collectively as a church, we engage in the sharing of our faith. Dear Lord, I want the desire in my heart to share my faith in you with others. I really want to have a mindset of loving you as you love and loving others as my neighbor. Lord, I want courage to put into practice sharing my love for you and your love for others. Lord, I want you to use me to make an eternal difference in the lives of my family, my friends, and whoever you send my way. But Lord, not just me. I pray for all of us at New Hope 
that all of us will have the desire, the mindset, and the willingness to put into practice sharing our faith with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week I briefly shared with you that uh, for the vast majority of my lifetime, there have been two forms of evangelism. Event evangelism, those are things like a Billy Graham crusade, uh, a, a, a revival in the old days in church, or what we would call a Bible conference, a special Sunday like we've had here called Make a Difference Sunday uh, in the past, special event days where we have a special desire to reach out and share our faith. And then the other side was cold call evangelism, just like a cold call salesman. You kind of go door to door, you hang out in a food court in a shopping mall, and you look for opportunities to just share your faith. And that's, that's really hard, and that's very, very intimidating. In the 1970s, uh, Leith Anderson wrote a book, and it was a phrase that was coined for several decades called friendship evangelism. Just how do we share our faith with those in the context of our own life? Uh, in, in this century, the 21st century, they've adopted a new term for that. It's called network evangelism. It's basically loving our neighbors, those that we come in contact with. Let me define network evangelism this way. It's a practical way to emphasize how every member can be a missionary how every member can be a missionary. Listen to what Tim, Kep, Tim Keller, pastor and author, wrote. There must be an atmosphere of expectation that every member will always have two to four people in an incubator, a force field in which people are being prayed for, given literature, brought to church, or other events where they can discover more about Jesus Christ. Why I think network evangelism may be the best form of evangelism, I think it's what was evident in the book of Acts as you read it closely, is number one, network evangelism recognizes the sovereignty of God. It develops this mindset in us that every person in our sphere of life matters, and it helps us to remember that God has you and I living at this moment, at this time in history, in this location on the globe, because He wants to work through us where we are. Do you realize, if you're still living... That means I haven't killed you in this service yet. <laughs> Do you realize that this is God's plan for you? I've often thought, as I read my Louis L'Amour novels, I read those and I've often thought, I was born at the wrong period of time in history. I should have been born in the 1800s. But that's me playing God with my own life. God knew when I was going to be born. God knew when you were going to be born. God knows when you're going to die. And between the birth and your death, this is God's timing for you. What are we going to do with it? What are we going to do with it? The second thing that Network Evangelist does, it promotes faithfulness and patience. It shows that we value people over generating numbers. See, network evangelism takes time. You're not grabbing somebody by the coat and saying, hey, if you died today, do you know where you'd spend eternity? If, if your family's never known Christ, nobody in your family, and all of a sudden, dad and husband gets saved, becomes a Christian. What do you think is going to make the difference in his wife and his kids coming to know Jesus? It's going to be by what they see at home. It won't happen. He's going to come home and say, hey guys, I got saved today, now I want you all to get saved. But more than likely, that won't happen. It can, but probably not. They're going to say... Let's see. And just because you got saved doesn't make you perfect right away, but there's going to be a difference in the way in which you treat your kids and the way in which you treat your wife. There's going to be a difference, and they're going to know if whether daddy really means what he says when he says, yeah, I'll be home early to be with you today. Yeah, I'll be at that event. They're going to watch and See, that takes time, patience, and faithfulness. We've got to grow in this relationship with Jesus. And so, but it shows that we value people over just notches in our belt. I'm not going to show that video clip. I had a video clip to show you, but I'm out of time. Let me, uh, let me close with this. 
Who's in your network? You have multiple networks in your life. I don't care what stage of life you're in. You have multiple networks. You have a family network. You have spouse, kids, aunts, uncles, cousins. You got a family network. Why don't you begin to think about which two or three members of your family you want God to put on your heart and you will look for occasions in which you can somehow share your faith with them. You have a geographical network where you live. All of you live somewhere. You live in a neighborhood. You live in a retirement community. You live in an apartment complex. You live somewhere. Begin to think, God, who do I have in this neighborhood that you would love to open a door that I could share my faith with? Most of you have a vocational network. If you're retired, then you have your retirement network. Either AARP or McDonald's. You, you have a network. You have a recreational network. People that you hang out with and do the things that you like. If you're in a bowling league, you got people in a bowling league. If you play bunco, you got people in your bunco group. If you, if you do hot rods and cars, you got that. Well, whatever your, your, your recreational area is, people you hang out with. Then you all of us have a commercial network where you shop, where you buy things, where you take your car to get fixed. You have all those areas, people you see. What if each of us New Hopians over this next year, we identified two to five people in each one of those five areas of our life, and we simply began to consider five things with those folks. Pray for them. You might be surprised what our attitude will be about people that God puts in our path when we pray for them. We might experience what C.S. Lewis wrote when he said, I have two lists of names in my prayers. Those for whose conversions I pray for and those for whose conversions I give thanks for. The little trickle of transfer from list A to list B is of great comfort. So we can pray for those two to five names in each category. How about invite them to something? To dinner at your house? To go to a sporting event? To go watch a movie? Come with you to a church event? Ladies, you're starting book clubs all over town? Invite a friend to a book club. Men, we got a men's breakfast. I, men love to eat. We love to eat when there's just men in the room too because we don't have to put the napkin in the right place. We don't even have to use the utensils if we don't want to. All right? <laughs> Something about a men's breakfast. <laughs> we got small groups. We got pie auctions. We got barbecues. Find something that you can invite them to share time with you. Then serve them. Identify a way that you can bless those in your network. Babysit for them. Pick up groceries. Cut the grass. Do something for them. How about provide some resource? A book, an article, uh, something that you just heard on the radio. Discuss these resources with them. And last of all, as opportunity provides itself, share the gospel with them. Share what Jesus is doing in your life. Share some of your own struggles. Hey, one of those friends invites you to go do something on a Sunday. Say, hey, you know what? I'd love to. Can we go about 11? Well, what are we going to wait? I go to church at 9.15. The pastor ends on time. I, I, I can make it by 11. Okay? <laughs> That's not, you're not inviting them to church, but what are you doing? You're letting them know that there is something. Like, well, couldn't you miss it this Sunday? Well, you know what? Sometimes I can't, but uh, man, it, uh, this is pretty, I just don't take off work, you know, for, this is really important to me. I, I don't go because I have to. I go because I love to. And man, I don't want, you, you, hey, I got an idea. Why don't you come with me at 915? As soon as it's over, man, we're out the door and we'll go do, what, you see, find ways in which you can Engage in this group of networks, vocational, family, geographical, commercial, recreational, or relational. Let me close with this. So begin to think about names. I'm going to actually, when I get back, I'm going to have a little card design. It's going to have these five networks, a place for you to put people's names, and then begin to check off as you do things for them. Let me close with this. There was an incident that occurred in connection with an encampment of Sha Tung soldiers in Shanghai. One day a dog came into their camp with some pages from a book in his mouth. The soldiers caught the dog and they began to read the papers that the dog had. They were papers from a Bible that was being printed in their own language. They became very interested and they followed the dog to a hospital that was run by Christian missionaries asking for more of this kind of literature. If it was available, they wanted to read it. 
The Christian hospital was glad to help, and this brought an opportunity for Dr. Goforth and a Chinese evangelist to go visit that camp of soldiers. After their visit, 200 men were enrolled in an inquirer's class to find out the message on the pages of the Bible they were reading. So the moral to this little story is this. If God can use a dog to deliver his word, then he can use any one of you to share your life with Christ with them. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, the gospel is good news. It's good news that my sins are forgiven. It's good news that I have a home in heaven. It's good news that in my life at this moment, the all-sufficient, the omnipotent, the all-knowing God lives in me to do for me what I could not do for myself. That is such good news. We should not keep it to ourselves. Father, I pray that you will have the freedom to create within each of us a mindset where we want to share our faith. And then give us the courage to put into practice what we believe to be true. Father, if there's someone who came to church today, they've heard a message about why we need to share our faith. But I believe in hearing this message, they heard enough about how they can become one of your children. A simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I need you. Forgive me of my sin. Come live within my life. I don't know all there is to know about a relationship with you, but I'm ready to start. Come live within my life. I'll look forward to learning more about who you are in the days ahead. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Guys, go have a great day. Mark, we'll see you next Sunday.